Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to join this year's International LGBTQ Leaders Conference. Tamara Anise Parker and everyone at the Victory Institute, thank you, thank you, thank you for your leadership and your bravery, for your belief in possibilities. A historic number of LGBTQ people ran for office this year, and they won many of them. It's an honor to be an ally and have been on the ballot with all of you. Vice President-elect Harris and I are committed to being the most pro-equality administration in history. But we can't do it without you. And we can't do it without my dear friend, Nancy Pelosi. Nancy, congratulations on receiving the Victory Institute's History Maker Award. You deserve it. Three decades in Congress, always on the right side of LGBTQ history. Always. And the fact that you can receive a History Maker Award for that and so much more is testament to your character, Nancy. It's a testament to the life's work to make real the promise of this country that you've been devoted to, that we're all created equal and deserve to be treated equally and with dignity and respect. You're a dear, dear friend, Nancy. You really are. You're an American treasure. <laughs> and I can't wait to work together again with you to continue to fight for full equality and to usher in a new era of LGBTQ rights and the entire movement. Well, God bless you, Nancy. You deserve this and so much more. And God bless us all. Good day to all of you and welcome. My name is Jason Maida and I am a proud board member at the LGBTQ Victory Fund. On a personal note, let me say how delighted I am that we are honoring my friend and our speaker, Nancy Pelosi, with the LGBTQ History Makers Award during today's plenary session. I also want to take a moment to thank Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and a devoted member of this community, also a dear friend, and let's face it, the best dressed man in town, Jonathan Capehart, for taking the time to moderate today's very important conversation. You know, we are so grateful to Colonel Jennifer Pritzker, founder of the Tawani Foundation and founder and chairwoman of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library for serving as executive sponsor of today's historic panel at this year's International LGBTQ Leaders Conference. Colonel Pritzker regrets that she couldn't be with us today. In her absence, I'm honored to share her following thoughts on the importance of this topic. Today's panel, 10 years later, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, reminded Colonel Pritzker of one of her favorite stories from military and American history. The year is 1975. And seemingly out of nowhere on the cover of Time magazine appeared Technical Sergeant Leonard Matlevich, in uniform, his face fully visible with an earnest, dedicated expression. The headline read, I am a homosexual. Sergeant Matlevich had been in the Air Force for 12 years with an exemplary record, but the Air Force didn't want him or any other LGBTQ American to defend their country in uniform. His brave decision to challenge this discrimination by coming out began to change all of that. He became not only the first gay service member to out himself on such a national stage, but the first gay person to be named openly on the cover of a national magazine. And this said to millions of LGBTQ people suffering in silence, you are not alone. You and your quest for freedom can be seen and it will be heard. His tombstone in Washington's Congressional Cemetery is unnamed, so it could serve as a memorial to all gay veterans. It reads, when I was in the military, they gave me a medal for killing two men and a discharge for loving one. An exceptional roster of other brave activists, service members, and elected officials took up Sergeant Matlevich's call to arms in the decades since. And today, we gather to hear from some of them. 10 years ago this month, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell Repeal Act was signed into law under the deft leadership of Speaker Pelosi with unwavering support from our allies, such, such as former Congressman Patrick Murphy, both with us today. We will also hear from Admiral Mullen, Valerie Jarrett, and Dr. Aaron Belkin with the Palm Center, leaders who played key roles in ending the ban. Today, a ban on transgender service remains with us, but seems to be in its very last throes. This is in thanks to some of the same people here with us today and the work and courage of heroes like Sergeant Matlovich. We're pleased to honor them and look forward to hearing what they have to say as we take up the fights ahead. Thank you and enjoy today's discussion.
My name is Claire Lucas, and I'm the proud board chair of the LGBTQ Victory Institute. Since the founding of our nation, LGBTQ people have served in our military, risking their lives on the front lines. Yet for the majority of that history, more than 225 years of it, LGBTQ people remained hidden, faced dishonorable discharge, or worse. Don't Ask, Don't Tell, signed into law in 1993, allowed gay, lesbian, and bisexual service members to serve as long as they remained hidden. However, the status quo remained unchanged for trans service members. While Americans became more supportive of equality, the injustice of LGBTQ service members having to hide their personal lives became more glaring. And the administration of Barack Obama and members of Congress led by Speaker Nancy Pelosi were determined to take action. 10 years ago, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And for the first time in American history, LGBTQ individuals were finally able to serve openly. Anti-LGBTQ activists claimed the sky would fall and disunity would erupt among fellow soldiers. But of course, their dire predictions proved unfounded. Today, you will get a behind the scenes look at the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell with perspectives from the White House, the US Congress, the military, and the advocacy community. You will hear about the impact of the repeal on LGBTQ service members and the country at large. Under the Trump administration, trans service members were again targeted with a ban that went into effect in April of 2019. Yet President-elect Joe Biden has promised to reinstate the Obama-era policy allowing trans people to serve openly. When soon all of our courageous LGBTQ service members can again be open about who they are, it will send a message to the world that the United States is a country that prizes equality. Whether in Baghdad, Berlin, or Washington, D.C., out service members transform perceptions of our community and influence policies at home and abroad. Thank you for joining us as we celebrate Speaker Nancy Pelosi with the LGBTQ History Maker Award for her work to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and for an insightful conversation about where we are and where we're headed. And of course, thank you to those who have served and are serving. Hello, this is Congressman Mark Takano. Hello, this is Congressman Mark Takano, and I am the only LGBTQ chairman of a full standing committee in the House of Representatives, the Committee on Veterans Affairs. Uh, and it's my distinct honor and privilege to send a message of congratulations uh, to Speaker Nancy Pelosi upon her receiving the inaugural LGBTQ History Makers Award for her achievement in leadership uh, in overturning the Don't Ask, Don't Tell uh, policy uh, in the lame duck session of the 111th Congress. Uh, she guided uh, the uh, repeal of that policy, uh, which uh, was so harmful to so many LGBTQ service members. Uh, and it's so reflective of who she is as a person, as a human being, um, someone guided by basic decency and horrified, um, horrified by uh, any kind of cruelty uh, that human beings inflict on one another. Early on in my career, our biggest fights were about stopping constitutional amendments from prohibiting gay people from getting married and trying to protect people from discrimination. It was really hard to imagine today's world, where now I'm able to marry my wife, raise our daughter, and be protected. And none of this progress would have been possible without the great work of the Victory Fund. And it certainly wouldn't have been possible without Speaker Nancy Pelosi. She's been an outspoken ally who stood in the fight with us and raised her voice long before so many others. She's been with us from the beginning. When no one else would raise their voice about the decimation of our community from the HIV AIDS epidemic, 
She was on the House floor fighting for needed funding. She fought for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, for the passage of the federal hate crimes laws, and she embraced marriage equality early on, even voting against DOMA in the 1990s. Today, she continues to fight for us and for the passage of the Equality Act. She's a true trailblazer who's one of our most important allies in the fight for full equality. Speaker Pelosi, thank you so much for helping create a more just world. And congratulations on such a well-deserved award. Madam Speaker, congratulations. When history looks back at this moment, we will see that you not only led the way of a Democratic Party, but you have been the conscience of our country. Fighting for progressive ideals, but making them real for so many that for far too long have been left outside the inclusiveness that our country sought for from its very founding. Whether it was fighting back against Don't Ask, Don't Tell, or leading the fight for the Equality Act, or trying to find all of the ways that we need to make our country kinder, more inclusive, stronger, and fairer. You've been at the forefront of every single fight. We are so grateful for you. Thank you, and congratulations. If it weren't for Nancy Pelosi's political skill, courage, and devotion to principle, Don't Ask, Don't Tell would still be on the books. In the lame duck session of 2010, she told the Senate that she would not pass the defense authorization bill that they'd worked on until they agreed to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Some of them didn't like it, but they did it because they knew she would follow through. It was the most effective use of political power on behalf of a principal I have ever seen. Hi, it's Pete Buttigieg, and I want to offer my congratulations to Speaker Pelosi for earning the LGBTQ History Makers Award from the Victory Institute. Your work throughout the years has made such a difference, including on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I think about what it meant when I first signed up to serve, knowing that I could be fired because of who I am. And just a few years later, because of the work of leaders like Speaker Pelosi, being able to include some of my fellow officers as guests at my wedding to Chaston. We got a long way to go on equality, but we've come such a long way thanks to leadership like yours. Congratulations again. Hi everyone, Gina Ortiz Jones. I served under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and it was actually a four-year Air Force ROTC scholarship that took me from San Antonio to Boston University. And one of the very first things I had to do there is sign a piece of paper that said, I will not engage in homosexual behavior because Don't Ask, Don't Tell applied to me even as a cadet. So my opportunity to get an education, my opportunity to serve our country, die for our country if need be, all of that goes away just because at the time there were not enough leaders with the courage to say anybody ready and willing to serve should have the opportunity to do so. Don't Ask, Don't Tell is a policy that never should have been and thankfully it is no more in no small part due to Speaker Pelosi's leadership. We know Speaker Pelosi is always ready to throw a punch for the children, and thankfully we also know that Speaker Pelosi is always ready to throw a punch for LGBTQ equality. So Speaker Pelosi, thank you for your leadership and for your courage. Speaker Pelosi, hi, it's Jim Obergefell from Obergefell v. Hodges. I just wanted to send along my congratulations on your honor as an LGBTQ history maker. You certainly deserve this award from your amazing work to help repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, to your support of marriage equality, something very personal to me. You have been an advocate and an ally for the LGBTQ plus community, and you definitely deserve this honor. Congratulations again, Speaker Pelosi. Congratulations, Speaker Pelosi, on being honored with the inaugural LGBTQ History Makers Award. Your leadership in repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell is just one example from a very long list of how you've helped make America better for the disenfranchised in our society. I am honored not only to call you a friend, but one of my heroines. Thank you for inspiring me and countless other women. You not only busted through the glass ceiling, you've ensured that the barriers are torn down they keep LGBTQ plus people, women, and so many others from living the lives they deserve. Congratulations. I love you, Nancy. Speaker Pelosi, Tim Gunn here to help celebrate with you the 10th anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. You, of course, played the key role in that historic achievement. 
And shortly thereafter, you and I hosted an LGBTQ reception in my apartment, at which you shared with us the more salient details of how the repeal actually happened. It was an astonishing and electrifying story, I have to say, and you made us all feel like very special insiders. Congratulations on receiving the Leadership Institute's inaugural LGBTQ History Makers Award and profuse thanks for your unparalleled support for our community. You are indeed a history maker every day. Hi, I'm Patrick Murphy, the 32nd Undersecretary of the Army, former U.S. Congressman from Pennsylvania. It's my honor to be here to present Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the LGBTQ History Maker Award. Speaker Pelosi is one of a kind. She is a true champion for equality, and I'm proud to call her my friend and one of America's best leaders. 17 years ago, I was in Baghdad, Iraq. I was with the 82nd Airborne Division. 19 of my brothers never made it home. In my time in the Army, over 13,000 of my brother and sister veterans were thrown out because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. It wasn't until we repealed Don't Ask, Don't Tell, until we had true equality in our military, and our fight is not over. Speaker Pelosi believes that you either believe in equality or you don't. You're either willing to fight for it or you're not. We all know she's a fighter. It's my honor and all of our honor to present to her the 2020 LGBTQ History Maker Award to Speaker Nancy Pelosi. The other side of the screen is among many who are responsible, but as Speaker of the House, she made it happen. Speaker Nancy Pelosi, thank you very much for being here. Congratulations on receiving the Victory Institute's LGBTQ History Maker Award. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, congratulations to you on your new show. We're all excited <laughs> about that. And thank you very much. To be with you as with all of the guests who are here. You said it so well, many people contributed to this success. I was proud to be speaker to orchestrate how we would get this done, and we'll talk some more about that. Uh, but it was about time. It was about time, the blessings of time, the blessings to have Admiral Mullen in the White House saying early in the year, in February, early in the year, that the time had come. It was about Valerie Jarrett being there with President Obama, without whom this would not have happened calling for the report and the rest. And when the report came later in the year, we could deal with it. But without President Obama's courageous leadership and Joe Biden right there with him, as you know, he's the leader on these issues in many ways. And then uh, to have um, uh, Patrick Murphy, what better spokesperson on the floor of the house and a, a veteran who served uh, with many LGBTQ uh, colleagues in the military and saw the injustice of it all and came and spoke with that authority. And Barney Frank, oh my gosh, he, what he didn't say is that he's the one that got Harry Reid on the phone and, and just insisted, insisted, though he, he was very generous in his comment, uh, but the fact is uh, it was essential that Barney Frank be so much a, a part of all of that. And we'll talk some more about uh, others who were involved, but I'm honored to have uh, Joe Biden say such nice things. Uh, one thing he said that struck me particularly is that we respect the dignity and worth of all people. And that's why we love each other so much because we have the shared values. There is no question in our mind that this is an injustice and we have much more work to do. But I'm humbled by the award, but uh, again, because so many people made it happen, but I'm happy to accept the <laughs> of all of them. But 
to Mayor P, to Tim Gunn, to Gina Ortiz-Jones, all people courageous in their fields, leaders, pioneers, visionaries. Um, Cindy Lauper, she, you know, I've been, we've honored her for her work in the LGBTQ community. I'm honored that she's with us today. And Tiffany, she's remarkable. Tiffany Muller has done such great things for cleaner government. That's her pioneer fight. Jim over to felt really, you made so much happen in the courts that we could not do uh, in the Congress. Thank you for that. And Joe Kennedy came, came in, was right, right away the chair of the Transgens Task Force, and, uh, task force that we had there, a leader in this community and in the Congress. I'm honored by his remarks. And of course, Mark Takano as chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee. How perfect is that? And thank you, Mark, for your kind words. But if you want to talk about how it happened, but the yes. Well, Madam Speaker, I, I should point out no one could see no one could see you during during uh, all of those remarks with the people you you were talking about, but I could see you, and the watching your reaction to what was being said um, tells me that this was of all the things of all the accomplishments you have you have made and in, um, in your two times as Speaker of the House in your legislative career. Is it fair to say, safe to say that this, the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, ranks in the top three? Oh, yes. Well, it ranks there with the repeat, with our, our hate crimes legislation, what we did uh, and that was largely attributed to Barney Frank, but the, you know, and so many other people as well. But uh, today receiving this has special poignancy because over the holidays, I found out that my nephew is, is David is going to be Skyler, and we're all filled with joy that Skyler has found her happiness. Oh wow! And all the rest of it. So we're very. Is this this my receiving this will have special meaning to Skyler, and this award has special meaning to me for that reason as well. And I was thinking, uh, not this year, not at the State of the Union where I tore up the speech, but the one the year before, we had. A, 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 we had a large number of trans uh, folks come in uniform uh, and we encouraged everyone to invite uh, folks uh, uh, to be visible in, in the State of the Union. And we had the reception before and then after we came back. With, I don't know why there might have been some anticipation uh, that there would have been a divine intervention that the president might have said something respectful out of respect for all this, but he didn't. And we were all crying in the room afterward. And what, why I mention it is because we were so proud of all these transgender members in uniform there. And then um, uh, Richard Trunka was there too, the president of the AFL-CAO, and he spoke about how proud he was to be in the room with them and what they meant to our country. And it, felt, it was very tearful. So again, it's personal. I guess that's the way you say it's personal. Right. So, Madam Speaker, um, Tim Gunn sort of teased us by saying that um, at a reception at his home, you gave them the salient details and made them insiders about what happened, how the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell happened. In, in the time that we have left, tell us, give us the inside, the inside skinny on, on what happened. Well, let me just first thank uh, Claire Lucas for her leadership uh, and as the uh, chair of the board and also Mayor Parker. I saw her in action many times in Houston. I know of her great leadership and how great it is uh, that she held heads up, heads up the Victory Institute, the fund. I um, thank them. Okay, here's the story. Now, many of you have heard it, but you haven't, some in the audience here have not. <laughs> But it's particularly salient right now because in another few days, we're going to take up the national defense bill again in that the national defense. Go back 10 years and in the, in the spring, I was at a Harvey Milk birthday party in honor of his birthday, but of course, uh, in tribute to him. And I said there, I said, we're going to be rid of, don't ask, don't tell by Christmas. I made that how much we're going to be better done. I said, but I had thought the report might come out sooner and we would have, uh, I could honor that promise since Admiral Mullen had so early on uh, uh, spoke out in favor of the, the fairness of all. So let me tell you this. 
and Mamola, and I don't know if you've ever heard this story. So we go to the floor, we have Patrick Murphy's amendment, but he works so hard. We go to the floor, pass the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the amendment to the National Defense Bill. We're so thrilled. We go to them, I go to my members and I said, you've made history today. You're making history today. I said, yes. Will you repeal, don't ask, don't tell? It's not just that. In order for that to happen, you, my progressive friends, are going to have to vote for the defense bill. Oh, no, no, we never vote for the defense bill. We never vote for the defense bill. We'll vote for the appropriations for defense, but we never vote for the defense bill. Barney Frank, John Lewis, uh, Dennis Kucinich, and as you are, you name it, the whole beautiful array of progressives of which I am one, but however. So I say, no, you don't understand. They're not going to vote for the bill. The Republicans are not going to vote for the bill. I can see it in their eyes. They're not going to vote for the bill. So in order for this bill to pass, oh, the Republicans always vote for the defense bill. They always do. They, they, they come here to do it. But they're not going to vote for the bill. Well, we can't. We know. We never, we have perfect records. We have awards, 100%. We never vote for the defense. Do me a favor. Stand in the back of the room and watch. And you watch. Now the Republican Party, defense bill, boom. Nine Republicans voted for the bill. Nine. Nine Republicans. Seven had voted, to their credit, for the repeal. Nine. That meant like 180 some voted. What, what's the number? 190, uh, 186 um, no's. Okay, well, 160 uh, no. Finally, anyway, well over 150 no's. There they go. I said, here you go. Don't ask, don't tell the appeal. Right down the center aisle, the parade of progressives to go vote for the first time and make history by voting for the first time <laughs> for the defense bill in order to protect Patrick Murphy's amendment. But as I said, we'd not have been there. And Jared Beller Janet knows it so well as does Admiral Mellon without the executive branch, without President Obama, uh, Joe Biden, and the, uh, the commitment to values and equality and justice uh, in the White House. So again, we knew that now, now of course then, then they didn't want to pass the bill with it in and people were, you know, the Senate, this or that. So as Barney indicated, when it came down to the fall now, when we're taking the conference report, um, there was some unease on the part of some. So to, alleviate, to, to comfort them, we said, the only way that we will pass the defense bill is if we have a commitment for an independent, standalone, freestanding bill that contained Patrick's uh, essence of that legislation. And Barney was on the phone with Harry and we said, should we take it to the floor or not? And Harry made the commitment, which he kept, that he was filing on fast track the bill to repeal, the actual standalone bill to repeal, don't ask, don't tell. So it was, uh, that was months. That was months of, shall we say, back and forth and this or that. But it was uh, it just the, the time long overdue to get it done. And well, I was very proud to be part of it, but there would be no, no way I could accept this award by saying I accept it on behalf of the House Democratic Caucus, which was so uh, so um, courageous because it wasn't a, it wasn't courage, courageous on my part. Uh, Dr. Belkin can tell you how blessed I am to represent San Franciscoans in many regards, including this. So that's really how we got there. I mean, Barney was so instrumental. Patrick Murphy was his initiative that he had served. And then, um, of course, Admiral Mullen and Mallory can speak to the White House involvement, which was, without that, we, it would have been a complete non-starter. But also the members of, the, of the, the, the committee that wrote the report deserve a lot of credit and for their courage in the report that they put forth. We have more to do. We have to pass the Equality Act, and discrimination in every place. We have we have so much more to do, but we feel confident and pride 
uh, proud uh, because of the courage of so many people. Madam, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Speaker, I cannot believe it has already been 10 years since the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell and since the heroic efforts made by you, uh, members in the House and the Senate, uh, and the three panelists we're about to, to talk to on the other side of this. Madam Speaker, I know you've got a lot of work to do uh, that's related to a, a lot of things that are pressing for all of us in this country. So I want to thank you for your time. Thank you for your service and to congratulate you again on receiving the Victory Institute's LGBTQ History Maker Award. Well, thank you. I'm honored to receive it. I thank Colonel Pritzker. I thank uh, Claire Lucas. I thank uh, uh, Matt, uh, Anise Parker. I call Matt or Mayor. Uh, I thank all of you and it's an honor to be with you. Good luck to you. Uh, good luck to you. And I will display this with great pride in the speaker's office and the members can see, come and take pride in the role that they played in all of this as well. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Madam Speaker. So now coming up are three people who were very involved in the story that, that the speaker just talked about, bringing Don't Ask, Don't Tell from a campaign promise to reality. These are three people who uh, I talked to, uh, with the exception of Admiral, Admiral Mullen, um, but I did talk to uh, Valerie Jarrett at the time when she was senior advisor to the president. I talked to Aaron Belkin um, at the time who was doing great research and was behind the scenes, pushing, pushing, pushing. These three, when I was asked to do this panel, I, um, when I saw the roster of people, the message I sent back after, of course, immediately saying yes, I said, these are all of my heroes um, and they all know it. I got a chance to tell Admiral Mullen uh, years ago to thank him very much for, for what he did. Uh, and I think with that, they're all here, they're all waiting. Let me bring in the panel. Here they are, Aaron Belkin, Valerie Jarrett, Admiral Mullen, thank you all very much for, for being here this afternoon. Good to be with you, Jonathan. Thanks, Jonathan. So um, Valerie Jarrett, I will start with you as Senior Advisor to the President of the United States. The floor is yours for your opening statement. Well, thank you, Jonathan, and hello, everyone. Of course, congratulations to Speaker Pelosi for this award. Well-deserved, her leadership was instrumental in this effort. I'll begin um, by saying that the only time in eight years that I actually went to the Hill for a vote uh, was for the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell vote in the Senate. And I remember being surrounded by so many of the advocates who had been working on this tirelessly for many years preceding President Obama's time in office. But as you said, Jonathan, this was a campaign promise that President Obama made. And from day one, we went about the business of laying the foundation for this effort. Now, all the advocates who are watching will remember that they turned up the heat pretty quickly. And I think their first choice was that the president should on his own unilaterally stop discharging people from the military who were openly gay. But President Obama was really looking for sustainable change. He didn't want to do something which he knew violated his authority of office. He wanted to make sure that the military was on board and that it passed through Congress so that we would never have to cross this road again. And that took a lot of time and effort. And my team, led by Brian Bond, who many of you know, was responsible for LGBTQ outreach. And we had a broad agenda. And many of the accomplishments over the arc of his presidency came to fruition but this one was really so important. And the reason why I wanted to be there on the Hill is because I had been so touched by the stories of those who were serving in the military and had to hide who they were. And I had people come to the White House out of uniform to share those stories with me. And I remember one woman talked about the fact that she couldn't display the photograph of her partner on her desk or invite her partner to any of the, of the events that had to do with work. Uh, she had to basically lie about who she was. Another one woman, even more acutely, told me about teaching ethics at West Point, which was her mm -hmm. job. And she said, how do I teach ethics to our men and women in the, in, uh, the military when I'm living a lie myself? How do I reconcile that? And so these stories that I heard on an ongoing basis, thanks to Brian bringing these people into the White House so that they could share the impact that this law was having on them just inspired me and moved me deeply. And believe me, we were catching a lot of heat from our family <laughs> allies 
And one of the funny stories was at the ceremony when the president actually signed the repeal, Brian, in his mischievous spirit, sat me next to the people who had been most vocal on television, <laughs> criticizing us, and there were tears all the way around, Jonathan. And I think it's a it was a template for how government and advocacy groups try to right wrongs and try to move that arc of the moral universe towards justice. And I would also mention that the day Don't Ask, Don't Tell passed the Senate was the same day that the DREAM Act failed. And my team had been working on both. And I remember President Obama went up to my office and he said to everyone, people who were, who were shedding tears of joy and, and tears of sorrow, and he said, we have to be inspired by what happened on Don't Ask, Don't Tell and not give up the fight that the fight is long and it is arduous and it is painful, but it is so worth it. And in closing, I really want to give a shout out to Admiral Mullen because Admiral, I was in my office when you testified on the Hill in, the, in early 2010. And I will never forget that you made it personal. And you were chairman of the Joint Chiefs, but you made your remarks personal to say a few things. Number one, that we can't ask this of those who serve, to ask them to live a lie and that you believe that the military would rise to this occasion and embrace those who were openly gay uh, equally among their membership. And I think that the long, painful process that we went through to enact this law, which required consultation and surveys and reports from the military, is why it has been such a successful law, not on the books, but in practice. Thanks, Valerie, and that is a great segue to um, one of my first military hero, true military hero, Admiral Mullen. Floor is yours. Thanks, Jonathan, uh, uh, and thanks, Valerie, for those comments. It's it's interesting sitting in a panel like this. Uh, one one might think that we know a lot about what's going on in everybody else's area, uh, and that's just not the case. So, listening to Speaker Pelosi. Uh, a very special woman, a very special leader. And I mean, knowing from where I sat, that, you know, knowing uh, at a high level, this wasn't gonna be easy, but actually my expectation was that she'd figure out how to get it done. And I really wasn't into any of those details uh, and she did. So I'd like to thank her, uh, your leadership and, and congratulations for the award. I'd also like to thank Pat Murphy and, and Pat Murphy was a, somebody I was connected to early on when he was in Congress. And he was a voice for this. Uh, you know, every time he had a had a, an opportunity to uh, present and discuss it. Uh, thanking President Obama. Uh, clearly, uh, I mean, my story on this is I heard then candidate Obama on the campaign trail say, uh, and I'm chairman, uh, uh, say basically that this was something he was going to get across the goal line. That got my attention, uh, and actually started to review and study it uh, over a two year period. Uh, this was not easy to put together as you can imagine inside uh, the Pentagon. And going from that to getting to a point where it was possible was uh, was really extraordinary. And I did a lot of my own uh, 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 sensing, if you will, to group focus groups around the world, including, uh, we shouldn't forget, we were in, at war in Iraq and Afghanistan at the time. Uh, and uh, in, from my perspective, uh, the way, one of the ways I say it is I couldn't get anybody younger than 30 years old to, to uh, actually be overly concerned about this issue. The young people, and they make up the vast majority of the military, uh, they wanted to talk about other things that were of their concern, but not this. Uh, and then the focus groups I did with those who had retired or been discharged about living a lie every day, uh, that they were in uniform, that, those were the ones that really uh, really moved me in the end. And so I get I get uh, a lot of plaudits for courage the day that I testified. Actually, it wasn't, it, it, I didn't see it as courageous at all. It, it was an issue of integrity. That was core to me. Uh, it's core to the military. And testifying in that regard uh, was really pretty simple. Uh, and what I found was that that actually changed the terms of reference for the debate and sort of set us on a path that, that eventually uh, would allow passage of the bill. One other individual who I engaged a lot with, who's no longer with us, but is a, was a dear friend, extraordinary woman uh, who supported national security efforts forever. And, and that was Ellen Tauscher, who, who sadly has passed away. But I can remember conversations with Ellen 
about how out of touch I was as a leader of the military with where we were vis-a-vis -vis the American people. And Ellen was a huge advocate, but she also was right. So there are a lot of people that are involved in making this happen. Uh, and it was a privilege to be a part of it. Thank you, Admiral Mullen and Dr. Aaron Belkin. Talk about, well, we'll get to the Q&A. Let's uh, hear your opening statement. You know, uh, Nancy Pelosi was my congresswoman in San Francisco uh, 30 years ago when I came out of the closet, and she has been my guardian angel uh, my whole professional career and has been right there uh, for me personally and for the community. And what an honor to share the stage with her uh, and with you, Jonathan, uh, whose editorials were so important during the repeal process and during the end game. And you were uh, uh, as much a part of this as, uh, as, as anyone uh, we're talking about here today. Um, and of course, with um, distinguished panelists, Admiral Mullen and, and Valerie Jarrett. Um, when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed 10 years ago, I was uh, during the Senate vote uh, on CNN and I broke down crying. And I guess, I guess um, we're talking about uh, tears today. Uh, a few of us, and and when I think about it, um, it was a little embarrassing to to cry at that point. But I think there were three reasons why the tears were were flowing, and one of those was that um, I was of course so happy, but also mindful of the incredible suffering that um, the gay and lesbian and bisexual troops uh, had suffered. Um, as a result of policies really going back to uh, 1919 and the revision of the Articles of War, um, service members like Alan Schindler and Barry Winchell, who were murdered for being gay, uh, service members who were sexually assaulted and knew that if they had reported their rapes, uh, they would have been outed and fired from the military. So I was, I was mindful of that suffering, and I think it's important to note that um, today. And the second reason uh, the, the tears were falling at that time was that there were so many advocates who'd been working for so many decades, uh, some behind the scenes and some not behind the scenes, people like Greta Kammermeyer and people like Perry Watkins, people like Zoe Dunning, uh, uh, Michelle Benneke and Dixon Osborne who started Service Members Legal Defense Network. I was, I was standing on the shoulders of giants, service members and civilians who'd been pushing for decades and decades and decades towards equality. And I think the third reason um, was the stakes and, and, and all of us during the conversation about Don't Ask, Don't Tell repeal were mindful of, of the impact on the military and the impact on the service members. But, but for me personally, this was never, it, it was not even about LGBTQ equality. It was really about America and what it means for citizenship when the government lies and lies in order to scapegoat a group of people and how incredibly dangerous that is when government policy is based on untruth and when those untruths get articulated in law and policy. And so, so part of the reason repeal was such a relief to me was that it, it felt like a moment when America was um, was was reaching its its potential as a as a society based on equality, but also evidence and fact, uh, as opposed to, to scapegoating and distortion. So it's a huge honor to be here today to discuss these events. Well, thanks, Dr. Belkin. And uh, as someone who has cried on on national and international television, no, don't don't ever worry about it. Let let the tear let the tears flow. Um, Let's open this to a Q and A. And Admiral Mullen, I want to I want to start with you because your speech before the Senate Armed Services Committee was on February second, two thousand ten, and you famously said, as Valerie pointed out, you said, "I'm speaking personally." You wrote or you said, "I cannot escape being troubled by the fact that we have in place a policy which forces young men and women to lie about who they are in order to defend their fellow citizens." Through my reporting, I learned that one, you kept your remarks a close hold, but two, you wrote them that morning at the kitchen table. And I'm, I'm wondering why did you feel that it was so important at that hearing, in that moment to say something so personal with, to your point um, about the reaction and what that, what that meant 
saying words that really did change the trajectory of the project you were about to undertake. Well, I'm not sure, I may have been editing in the morning at the kitchen table, Jonathan, but I'm, I'm not sure I, I wrote the whole thing there. Actually, mm -hmm. I, I clearly didn't share it. Normally I shared everything I was doing with my fellow service chiefs and, and they were not happy after that testimony that I had not given them a preview, <laughs> but it was, it was guaranteed to leak uh, ahead of time. And I did not want to take that moment away if I could preserve it, first of all. Secondly, uh, normally, I mean, I recognize a long time ago that those hearings, that is not my stage, that is the member stage. Uh, and what I chose to do, which was uh, against the norm, was to make that statement in my opening statement before it could get uh, 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 configured in a way by a member with sort of a different slant or a different meaning. So I wanted to get it out there very early. Uh, and I mentioned earlier in my remarks about the, the integrity issue. So there were not a lot of people the White House had actually seen it, although I'd gotten no, no feedback, quite frankly, uh, at that particular point, because it was all moving pretty quickly. I knew that Senator Levin was going to ask me about my personal opinion. So again, I wanted to get it out before uh, the debate started on the stage, if you will, that was the hearing. Uh, so that was really, and, and I indicated earlier, it was, at that point, it really wasn't a courageous statement for me because it was based on our core value of integrity. Uh, and actually from that moment on, uh, you know, prior to that, it had too often, the debate had been too often about sex, you know, and sexual orientation. From that moment on, that no one who opposed this ever took on that issue of integrity. Not even John McCain, who I actually had sat with in his office just the two of us with one of his staffers six months before that. And I raised the, he asked me about this and I raised the issue of integrity and, and McCain was, was actually sort of startled because integrity is so core to him as an individual. Uh, and, and even though he continued to oppose it after I testified, th that was an issue he absolutely never took on. And I wasn't surprised. You know, um, uh, Aaron, Valerie talked about the, the import of what Admiral Mullen said in his testimony um, to the Senate Armed Services Committee. From your, from your vantage point, what did that mean for what you were doing? Well, I, I would respectfully um, disagree with Admiral Mullen that that was not a courageous statement. That was, uh, <laughs> that was historic and it was so brave. And it was the first time that a chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff had spoken uh, in such terms about uh, gay, lesbian, and bisexual service members uh, in an inclusive way. And uh, it changed the entire conversation because once, and, and I remember exactly where I was at that moment, I was in a green room at the Naval Postgraduate School in Newport, Rhode Island, where I was giving a talk on Don't Ask, Don't Tell's impact on military readiness. And people in the room were stunned as they were watching this. And these were uh, senior uniformed officers at the Naval Postgraduate School. Um, excuse, excuse me, the Naval, Naval War College. Uh, um, and uh, what this statement meant was that moving forward through the rest of the repeal conversation, really, you couldn't make the arguments with a straight face that don't ask, don't tell was good for the military. People tried to make that argument, but the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff had just said that that wasn't right. And so uh, that was, I, I, I mean, that was frankly the day we won, even though a lot of people and Valerie Jarrett, President Obama, a lot of leaders had to invest a lot of uh, difficult effort and elbow grease. Um, um, but that really was the day we won when Admiral Mullen made those brave remarks. Valerie, let's talk more about President Obama's role in all of this. Uh, you mentioned in your um, opening statement how there are a lot of people who were not happy with the president and the administration in terms of the pace people wanting it done immediately, but the, the president insisting on, on a process, a clear process that would take time. And it's, uh, there are folks who thought he wasn't moving fast enough. President Obama gave a speech uh, telling activists to quote, make me do it, uh, to give him leverage. To what extent did President Obama need that leverage to push repeal forward? Jonathan, not only did he need it to push repeal forward for Don't Ask, Don't Tell, but he needed it for our entire agenda. As you know, he started his career as a community organizer 
on the south side of Chicago. He believes that the power is truly vested in the people and that they have to show those who represent them that they care about an issue. And that, that energy coming from the ground helps propel everything forward, not just this, but everything forward. And I do remember late in the process when the advocates were particularly annoyed with us, uh, Brian was supposed to have a meeting with them over in the old executive office building next to the West Wing. And he came to my office and he said, will you please do me a favor, will you come and join me in the meeting because they no longer believe me when I tell them that President Obama is committed to this. And so I said, sure, I'll come. So I was, a meeting, I was in a meeting in the Roosevelt Room with President Obama just prior to that. And he said, what are you doing next? And I said, I'm gonna go and meet with the activists who are upset that you haven't yet uh, pushed through legislation to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And he said, you know what? I'll meet with them. And so everybody came over from the EEOB and sat around the table in the Roosevelt Room. And I remember so vividly, Jonathan, him looking each one of them in the eye and he said, I commit to you. I have a strategy to get this done. Now he knew he had the win at his back because of all the hard work that Admiral Mullen had done in the military. But he also recognized that he owed them that accountability, a face-to-face -face meeting where they could look at the President of the United States, the leader of the free world, and he could say to them, I am going to get this done. And so that accountability, I think, is so important to those who serve in public life. So, uh, Aaron, to that, to that point, can you talk about what, what lessons um, did we learn about American politics and especially LGBTQ politics from the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Yeah, I would say a couple of things. First of all, that facts matter. And there was a lot of pressure on us in the community um, to not talk about the way that Don't Ask, Don't Tell was undermining military readiness and to talk instead about fairness and equality. And this is going back uh, uh, 10 years before the events we're talking about today. This is in the in the early stages of the conversation. Um, but, but we said, no, we have to engage the folks who are supporting discrimination on their own terms. And they're saying that gays and lesbians uh, undermine, uh, undermine the military. Well, let's look at that and let's study that and let's figure out what the research says. So, so I would say the first thing is that facts matter and it's very, very important that policy be based on evidence. And the second thing I would say is that the people who opposed gays and lesbians and bisexuals in the military, and, and we have not spoken yet about transgender troops, so that's, a, that's another conversation, <clears throat> but they, right. they, they were exactly right in uh, positing that once uh, uh, GLB service members were allowed in the military, that would open up a space for other rights, such as marriage equality. And if you look at societies going back a thousand years, the marker of a first-class citizen is always whether someone can serve in the military or not. So the second important lesson from this is that service in the military is so important as a marker of citizenship. You know, Admiral Mullen, actually to what um, uh, Aaron was just talking about in terms of transgender service members, at the time of trying to repeal uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell, there was a lot of talk within the military that the sky would fall if service members could uh, could open um, could openly serve uh, gay men and lesbians, but as we've seen, um, especially with the current administration, transgender service members um, were are, are are still at risk. And I'm just wondering, from your vantage point, how much more difficult is it going to be for the military, or actually, I should say, for incoming President Biden, to make transgender service members whole and allow them to serve openly also in the military without fear of retribution or losing the jobs that they love. John, if I could just one thing I'd like to say to Valerie, sure. and j just as with Speaker Pelosi, I, I know there's a, obviously a ton of work that goes on behind making this happen. And one of the things that I'm so appreciative of her and the president was how much patience they showed. I needed that patience to get the military leadership aboard. And I didn't know details, but I knew he was getting hammered by the left hard, who didn't think that we were gonna let it happen, first of all. And then secondly, that, you know, they wanted it now. And so that patience, that leadership 
that Valerie describes is absolutely critical to, to getting this done. And it was very obvious to me and others, other senior leaders uh, specifically. You know, it wasn't too long after uh, the Trump administration came in that I get a phone call from, from uh, my good friend Aaron saying, you know, will you now get engaged on the transgender issue? Uh, um, and, and, and I sometimes, I mean, I look at myself in terms of what I understand. And while I knew a fair amount about gays and lesbians, just because of my life, you know, the transgender world was not a world that I knew a lot about. So what Aaron is saying, it facts really do matter here and understanding the reality of it, as opposed to the rhetoric that's oftentimes used, um, uh, to scare people off, uh, it is really critical, but I'm in the same place. I mean, this you should be allowed to serve your nation unless you are you know ineligible for some reason and this should not be a reason somebody that wants to raise their hand be willing to die for their country it should not matter what their background is and hopefully and, and in that regard uh if i looked at execution of don't ask don't tell of the elimination of don't ask don't tell then you know a friend of mine who was the head of the british military and they had gone through this about 10 years before we did and I asked him about it. I said, what happened? He said, there was great kerfuffle up front. After it got passed, it was a nothing sandwich. It has been basically that for us. Uh, and so my expectation uh, as President-elect Biden or President Biden comes in, that it will be relatively easy to get this straight for transgender personnel. And the military, now again, I'm not there anymore, but the military uh, will be very supportive of that if that's what the president wants to do. Aaron, from your perch, do you share the Admiral's optimism? I do. Um, Valerie Jarrett, and President Obama, and former Secretary Carter um, lifted the transgender ban uh, on June 30th, 2016. And what followed was uh, two and a half years of successful inclusive policy for trans troops. And we know that it was successful because uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, then Army uh, 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 Chief of Staff, Mark Milley, uh, testified in the Senate and all the other service chiefs also testified that there were quote unquote zero problems with inclusive policy. Um, the next administration came into office and then uh, implemented a new ban on transgender service members, even though inclusive policy was working. Um, and the research shows that that ban itself uh, has undermined uh, has undermined military readiness. Uh, I'm very proud that my colleagues uh, at the Palm Center, um, with former uh, military surgeons general, uh, just released a, a report that showed that the ban uh, has been uh, undermining military re uh, readiness. And for that reason, uh, President-elect Biden has pledged that on day one, uh, he will order the Defense Department to uh, to reinstate inclusive policy for transgender troops, policy that worked before and that will work again. And I have every reason to believe uh, uh, him and to take him at his word that he will reinstate inclusive policy. Mm -hmm. Valerie, when when you guys came into the White House, when President Obama and Vice, then Vice President Biden, uh, the administration began, as we've talked about, repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell was a campaign promise. But when you guys went into the White House, you had an economy that was in free fall. The auto industry was falling apart. You had the, the what was it, the, the Horizon Gulf thing blew up. You, <laughs> it seemed like every month there was a new calamity confronting this brand new administration. At any point, was there ever any thought given to putting the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell off to the side, to not even deal with it? in the in the first year let alone the first term no in a word absolutely not i mean one of the strengths i think of president obama's leadership is his ability to multitask and that we could move forward a very aggressive domestic and international agenda uh, by organizing ourselves around those issues and so the people who were working on the repeal of don't ask don't tell were not the same people who were working on restoring and recovering our economy or any of the other big ticket items, the Affordable Care Act, uh, getting out of two wars. Were, we had a lot of business going on at the same time and we organized ourselves accordingly. So no, there was not a single meeting. There was not a single consideration of taking this off the table. And I think for all of the reasons that we were talking, we've been talking about Jonathan, and that is, is that 
this speaks to the core values of our country. I mean, we want to have the best military in the world. We have to lead by example and be inclusive and not, as Admiral Mullen said, let uh, criteria that do not um, do not pertain to our ability to have that most supreme military uh, be factors in who serves. And so this was a core value issue. It was important to him. And he recognized that we had to have the ability to move forward on multiple fronts. And thank goodness we had leadership in the House, certainly by Speaker Pelosi and everyone in her caucus and who understood that we had to make trade-offs yet, but not ones that had to do with the core values of our agenda. And so I think it was a team effort, the military, the White House, the president's commitment, and obviously um, uh, Speaker Pelosi. And then those in the Senate who stood up and did the right thing as well, decisions that would have been a lot harder, if not impossible for them to make without the leadership of Admiral Mullen and those in the military. In a sense, yeah, I, we gave a permission oh, structure where one did not exist before, and I do think it helped turn the tide. You know, I want to pick up on a line you you all have used, particularly you, Valerie, in your last your last answer, and that is core values. And I, I wrote it down: core values, and then put on top American core values. And I'm throwing this to to the admiral and to Aaron because, given the current administration that we have, I'm wondering how damaging is it when the commander in chief doesn't reflect those core values. And I say that with um, the tweets that the president has sent out with regard to transgender service members serving and, and pushing really hard to drum them out of the service. What does that do to not just the, the, the readiness and the effectiveness, but the morale of service members? I'll start with you, Admiral. Jonathan, I'm not sure. I mean, one of the reasons this was, uh, in fact, not that big of an issue, that is don't ask, uh, don't, ask don't tell, uh, repealing that. Uh, you know, I try to remind people the average age in any military unit is 21 years old. And, and these young people have been living in a much more equal world at their level as they've grown up. And so it is, again, sometimes befuddling that uh, some of us older people, you know, get in the way of what they understand are their core values and what they live by, uh, first of all. So there's no question, and it's been this way through history, that what the president says matters. Those words really matter. And I think to the degree and the intensity and the length of time uh, that uh, any president, and certainly President Trump over the last four years, devalues our values, that is significant. I think not just to the military, that's significant to the country. It undermines our basic structure, our basic foundation, our basic being, the integrity piece, the equality piece, et cetera. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't think the, I, I don't think it, that has a huge impact on morale. There certainly are those who have suffered because of that inside the military, but I think the military will bounce back very, very quickly under the leadership of President Biden. Aaron? Yeah, I, I mean, I've been concerned about the politicization of the military, um, giving campaign speeches um, uh, in front of military audiences. But on the question of the president's transgender tweets um, specifically, part of what was so dangerous about those tweets from my perspective is that they repeated a move that was made at the beginning of Don't Ask for Help. So what was the similarity of the moves? Well, in both cases, the gist, the whole, um, the, the whole push for, for bad policy, for discrimination, was really about animus and intolerance. You could say homophobia in the case of gays and lesbians and transphobia uh, in the case of trans troops. But there was a veneer that was put on top of that that wasn't true, that was that the reason that we have to discriminate is because gays and lesbians or then later transgender troops undermine the military. And so you had the president of the United States making a claim about military readiness that was designed to shroud a motive that was grounded in animus and intolerance. And that is very dangerous uh, for reasons we've discussed when, um, when leaders and policymakers don't tell the truth about what they're doing. Valerie, how much do you see the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell as part of your legacy 
of public service in the White House. Jonathan, you know that my commitment to the strength of diversity, inclusion, a more equal and just world has been what has driven me since my early days in public service. And so this was really important to me, but I wanna emphasize that what's important is, is it important to our country? And so not just for those service members who can openly serve, but for the strength of our military and the character and integrity and those core values, as I said before, of our country, I think that's what's most important. And I think it lays a predicate for much of the change that we still have left that lies ahead, as Speaker Pelosi mentioned in her remarks. We are not done yet. We still have many examples across our country of injustice, racial injustice, uh, injustice based on gender identity and sexual orientation, on faith, um, on age, on people with disabilities. We have a lot of hard work to do that lies ahead. But what I think is instrumental here is it is it is a roadmap for how change happens, where advocates recognize their power, where they are resilient and determined and do not give up. And I know just as you said, we didn't give up. Well, you know what? They didn't give up either. And for those who fought the battle, knowing that they had already been discharged and wouldn't necessarily see the benefit of this work personally, but recognize that their stories that they could tell about the impact that this unfair law was having on their lives. All of that is a part of what makes the foundation of our democracy so strong. And I think it's also why we need to have leaders who understand that their responsibility is to serve all of the country, not just some of the country, but the entire country. And that that rich diversity of our country is what gives us a competitive advantage. It's what allows the United States to lead the world. And so fighting for those core values takes hard work, it all takes longer than it should. We're celebrating the 100th anniversary of white women having the right to vote this year. And we know that it took decades longer for black women to have that right to vote. So these journeys have always been arduous. And I say, I guess I'd say in closing of this that remember when President Obama took office, marriage equality was only legal in two states. So by the time the Supreme Court ruled six years later, it was legal in 37 states in the District of Columbia. Why? because advocates went state by state by state and fought that battle and changed our culture. And that's how change happens in America. Admiral Mullen, you've said several times in this, uh, in our conversation that you don't view what you said at the Senate Armed Services Committee as courageous at all. But I do wonder where does um, the successful repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell fall in terms of, of, of your accomplishments. I'm wondering how important is it to your legacy as an admiral, a member of the military, and the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs? I think, Jonathan, more important than I understood at the time. Uh, when I first took over the job under President Bush in 2007, one of my immediate staff uh, assistants said to me, you really need to be thinking about your legacy. And I looked at her and I said, I am not interested in my legacy. My legacy is going to be what it is going to be. So, and that is counter, oftentimes counterintuitive in Washington where people are trying to pound out legacies from day one. And so I just didn't have time to think about that. That said, uh, Admiral John Kirby, who was my public affairs officer at the time, you know, that night after I testified is you, this is what you will be most remembered for is that testimony. So I suppose, and I suppose that that really is true. Not that I was trying to gain that, but it is a fact it's, I was there It's a great privilege to be there and a great opportunity. And it obviously has made a huge, huge difference. Uh, I didn't understand, even at the time, I just didn't understand how critical this link in the chain of inequality, you know, finally bringing it together, finally joining it would be, and, and, and actually, provide another link for the chain downstream to be put together as both the speaker and Valerie uh, and Aaron have said today. Uh, Aaron, your work is ongoing. So um, I don't have a, a legacy question for you like I had for Valerie and for the Admiral, but from your, your vantage point in terms of the, the ongoing fight for LGBTQ equality, where, where are we now that we do have, we're celebrating the 10th anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. We're five years 
out from marriage equality being being the law of the land. Where's the next, where is, I was gonna say the next battle. No, where is the battle being waged now? Yeah, um, I, I wanna answer that, but first just briefly touch on, uh, if it's okay, a question of legacy. Um, sure. Matt, actually, Admiral Mullins and, and Valerie Jarrett's and, and President Obama's, um, I return to West Point and the Air Force Academy um, almost every year uh, to give talks about LGBT military issues. And um, uh, for the first time after Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, I could actually uh, meet with the with the cadets and the, the students um, themselves. And, and now when you have those meetings with groups of LGBT uh, 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 students, um, uh, they don't even know about uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, they know wow. about the but, but But I tell them when that happens, um, I say, this is exactly what everyone was fighting for. This is the legacy that you don't have to worry about discrimination. You, you don't need to worry about, um, about uh, hiding or about fear or anything like that. And it, it just, it's so moving to see the lightness. Um, uh, 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 the, the, they don't carry the burden of, of, of discrimination. In terms of where the fight is now in the military, uh, President-elect Biden, uh, is going to reinstate inclusive policy for transgender troops. Uh, there's some additional work to be done um, in terms of uh, working with the VA uh, to offer surgery to transgender veterans. Uh, there's the question of military service um, by non-binary service members, um, service members also with intersex DSD conditions. Um, and then there's gonna be a complicated conversation over uh, transition-related surgery for uh, family members and dependents um, who get their health care through a military health insurance program called TRICARE. Um, so there are uh, fights um, left um, in the military. And then beyond that, I would just echo what Valerie Jarrett said, that to my mind, um, the struggles that lay, that lay ahead are really intersectional. And, and to my mind, they're about the ability of the community to work across lines of class, race, ethnicity, ability, um, and to work together um, as Americans to, to lift all of our boats together. Aaron, I'm gonna ask you one more, one more question before I go round robin one more time with, with uh, final thoughts. Given the political environment uh, that we are in right now, just asking you to speak broadly, how concerned are you that the, the rights that the community is pushing for and demanding and is you know, requesting of of their government that they won't they won't be achieved because gridlock has become so intense that it really is putting the lock in gridlock that nothing will happen are you how concerned are you that nothing will move no matter how, how hard the the Biden administration pushes yeah, I see there's only a minute left, so I'll just say briefly so the other speakers can, can weigh in. But what I'm most concerned about is gridlock uh, in Congress and also the courts, and that the courts are going to work very hard to roll back hard won rights moving forward. All right. Well, we we have um, a chunk of time left for, for closing statements. Um, there is no question. I'm just giving you each an opportunity to give final thoughts before we close out this great discussion. Admiral Mullen, I will start with you. Uh, your your closing thoughts. Just uh, just a moment that I think will. Uh, and, and Aaron started with you know uh, saying that he had you know was was in tears on national television at one point. Uh, right after there's there's such a human dimension to this. Don't ask, don't tell story. And right after I retired, the following uh, um, uh, October, I was asked to go to an event in Washington, uh, in New York, on the Intrepid. That that many of the advocates for this wanted to just say thanks, and I I declined basically because I was I, I almost looked at it. Look, I've given at the office. I just need some time to rest, spend time with my family. A year late, and I said, let's look at it next year. The following year. Uh, I agreed to do this. And what one of the leaders said to me, so we went to New York, my wife and I went to New York, and it was it was as joyous a celebration of about 1,100 people as I've ever seen in my life. I mean, it, it was just, there was a freedom aspect of it. There was just out and out joy uh, and tears. And what one 
uh, uh, gay and lesbian leader told me is what you don't uh, talking to me, what you don't understand is you are in so many of these people's lives, the first person in authority in their life that has ever said it's okay and acknowledges them. And that's from their family, their school, their jobs, wherever it might be. And that was jarring to me that that, that was part of it. And they wanted to say thanks for that. And then at that affair was an 82, 83, 84 year old World War II veteran who literally came up to me, who was gay and had fought in World War II and was heroic in his fight. And he just looked at me, sort of grabbed me by the shoulders and said he couldn't thank me enough. He'd been waiting his whole life to be acknowledged for who he was. And I'll never forget that. Wow, anybody, I mean, I have chills hearing that story, Admiral. Thank you for sharing that story. Senior advisor to the President of the United States, Valerie Jarrett, um, to President Obama, your closing thoughts. So the year after the effective date of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the Defense Department had a gay pride uh, celebration at the Pentagon, something that would have been unheard of uh, prior to the passage of the repeal of the law. And they invited me to come and speak, which of course I was honored to do. And I remember as I walked up to the podium, I started looking around the auditorium at the audience. And several of the people who had come to the White House to advocate for the repeal of the law were sitting in the audience in uniform. And I, I literally could not speak from it. I was so moved to tears to think that we had changed not only their lives, but the lives of so many Americans who wanted to serve in our military and either were deterred from entering or felt they had to tell, to tell a lie in order to serve. And that that was over. And, and the fact that now we're gonna have future generations who have no idea what we're talking about when we talk about discrimination in the military. And that's how our country moves forward. And so I'll never forget that day looking around the room, I can still see their faces and they all kind of winked at me, but they were able to sit there proudly being who they are while making, while being prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice for our country. And that reflects to me the goodness of America. And I think it's a goodness that we have to fight for. It's a goodness that we've seen over the last four years that we cannot take for granted. And it's a goodness that is grounded in the hard work of ordinary people prepared to do extraordinary things. And Dr. Aaron Belkin, founding founding director of the Palm Center, a great resource for me during that during the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Your closing thoughts. Uh, it's been the honor of a lifetime to work uh, for the last 21 years um, uh, towards uh, inclusive policy for LGBT service members in the military. It has been the honor of a lifetime uh, to serve on this panel and to celebrate history um, which with, um, with such uh, distinguished panelists. I think in closing, I will just remain mindful of the the sacrifices that uh, LGBT service members have made to, to serve their country and the bravery of, you know, my advocacy, it's in a library. So I, I you know, that's, that's not difficult work to do, but, but I think about people like Frank Kameny, who in 1965, uh, when it was very unsafe to do this, was parading in front of the White House with a sign that said, uh, homosexuals serve in the military using, using language of the day. I think about my friend and colleague, um, Admiral Al Steinman. The only way he was able to make Admiral was for him to pretend to be straight for his 30-year career, which meant uh, having phony dates uh, to formal military occasions where he would take someone who he would pretend to be um, uh, his his girlfriend and all the range of of brave sacrifices that others have make so uh, have made. So um, I'm just uh, all, all, all I feel at this point is is, is gratitude um, and uh, and hopefulness moving forward that we're going to extend um, the rights that that folks have earned for uh, gay and lesbian service members. We're going to get them back for trans troops and we're going to move forward for, for from them. Um, and I just want to end by saying what I said at the beginning, which is when I was asked to, to do this 
to do this panel after immediately saying yes and seeing who was on the roster to be a part of this conversation that we had, I really did say, wow, these are all of my heroes. Admiral Mullen, Valerie Jarrett, Aaron Belkin, thank you very, very much for being here this afternoon, for your service to our country, but most importantly, for all the work you did both publicly and behind the scenes to bring this country a big step closer to living out its ideals. Thank you very, very much. Thanks, Jonathan.